Thanks. I want to say to start out, I teach communication to scientists. And everything that Paul said to you is pretty much exactly spot on. I mean, I think from my talk, you can kind of build level two, sort of like ninja black belt level communication, you know, dealing with all kinds of different. But, but the basics of what he said, you know, I completely endorse. There's little things, there's little footnotes that we could debate about. But I think it's, uh, I think it's really great advice. So please take it to heart. Well, I want to tell you about the Republican brain and how it's different and how it's not something that you are going to necessarily relate to naturally. In fact, you're going to have a hard time relating to it, but you need to understand it. This is controversial stuff, but it actually shouldn't be. It's not scientifically controversial. The book, when it came out, it's been out three months now. Uh, there is no serious scientific criticism of anything that I've said. Okay? It's just politically controversial, but scientifically it's actually not. Uh, and in it, I cite a large body of scientific research. And I've tweeted twice today, uh, using the hashtag, so you should be able to find it, a link to a bunch of papers from my blog where you can go and start to read some of the science yourself. I mean, if you're interested in this stuff, you're free thinking, critically thinking people, I know you are. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go read the published peer-reviewed research on the differences between liberals and conservatives yourself. And I only listed 11 genetic studies and 8 brain uh, and physiological studies. It's just a tiny bit of what's actually out there because the, the most studies are in psychology, not in genetics, not in not in neuroscience, they're in psychology, I didn't even list those. But anyway, it can just get you started reading this stuff so you can know it's real, it's not made up. The scientists did it, it's not my fault. It's their fault, all right? The upshot is that I used to really, really misunderstand the people who disagree with me. I did not get what makes them tick. And in fact, as a liberal, I'm a moderate liberal, I'm not as liberal as, as some, but as a liberal, I used to think what a lot of liberals think about their opponents. I thought that the reason they were coming at it differently than I was was that either they were driven by religion, on the one hand, or they were driven by money and self-interest, on the other hand. So if you wanted to understand why conservatives are acting the way they do, you would either do this old journalistic trick called follow the money, in other words, figure out who's funding them. Is it ExxonMobil? Is it the Koch brothers? What have you. Or follow the religion, which is kind of the same thing. Figure out what the religious right's role in this is. And there's often big money actually supporting the religious right as well. And that was sort of the approach taken in my 2005, my first book. It was called The Republican War on Science. And it played a kind of central role in defining this whole idea that there's a unique right-wing problem with science, with, with fact. All right, so I want to start the story there because I've learned a lot since then. It's not the Republican war on science was wrong, but its analysis was sort of incomplete. Okay, so we'll go back to 2005. Here's the book. And at the outset, I like to disclose to all my audiences, we were not trying to echo the cover image of another popular book that was out at the same time. So we, you know, we only noticed that later. The, the argument of my book <laughs> was more complex. And <laughs> in it, what I, what I claimed was that under the administration of George W. Bush, our last president, scientific knowledge was under attack uh, on global warming, on stem cell research, on evolution, and on and on and on. I think if you want to kind of capture the ethos of the George W. Bush era, uh, then I think it's pretty well captured in a quotation that he gave, actually, to a reporter following the, the 2004 devastating tsunami killed so many people in uh, Pacific Rim countries and uh, the Indian Ocean area. Everybody remembers the Christmas tsunami of 2004 and the just terrible disaster. And Bush was giving a press conference, and a journalist asked him a sort of scientific question. Uh, and the question was, Mr. President, does the United States have a warning system in place to protect us from tsunamis you know, here at home? And Bush had no earthly idea whether we did or not. He was completely clueless. But he tried to answer. He sort of hemmed and hawed. And he finally started to say something scientific in response. He started to say, well, you know, I think we might be less vulnerable than other parts of the world to tsunamis. 
But then, as he quickly added, I am not a geologist, as you know. And I think that sort of is the Bush administration on science in sort of a nutshell. So things, things under Bush were bad when it, when it comes to science. Uh, and this is what I was writing about, and it was a bestseller, and it, it drew a lot of attention, sent me out on the road to talk about it, and I was explaining why. I was explaining why science was so messed up under Bush. And the kind of story I was telling was a story that I would describe as being political in nature and being environmental in nature. In other words, I was doing what a political journalist often does. All right? And political just means I was following the money, you know, the money trail. Environmental, I don't mean, you know, in the sense of writing about clean air and clean water. I mean, I was attributing what Republicans were doing with science, not to something inherent about who they are, in other words, their nature, their core being, their, you know, their identity. I was rather attributing it to the political environment in which all of this happens, in which they have to get ahead or, get, or fall behind their political opponents. Uh, in other words, the bad behavior with respect to science I was claiming was emerging from the political ecosystem that existed in the way politics existed. And so I would say, you know, this is a conservative movement that's grown up over the past several decades. It grew up for particular historical reasons. Uh, it came to encompass the religious right, but also corporate interests. And once that became what the movement was and how it was constituted, politicians, in order to get elected, had to appeal to those interests. They had to appeal to the religious right. They had to appeal to the big Exxon Mobiles of the world. Okay? And those groups didn't like science. So of course Republican politicians said what those groups wanted them to say, and voila, you have the Bush administration and all of its anti-science behavior. This storm of science abuse and denial. That was the argument then. All right? Was that account wrong? My answer is incomplete. The basic story has clearly got something going for it. Because this is a recent study that came out in the American Sociological Review in which a guy named Gordon Goshot actually tried to test the Republican war on science hypothesis scientifically. And it was, it's really great as a journalist to see someone say, you know, we set out to test the hypothesis of Mooney 2005. All right, so he's like, oh, I'm in the literature. Uh, and what he found was that if you look at people's trust in institutions in America, uh, one of the institutions is science, all right? And the trust in institutions has been declining across the board, but trust in science has been declining much more among conservatives, the red line, than it has been declining among liberals or among moderates, the other two lines. So Goshat said Mooney was right. This is a unique conservative phenomenon. And then he went on to give an environmental account, just of the sort that I've described. Uh, but he did this even as I was starting to question whether that was really the right reason. I mean, definitely conservatives have a problem with science. But is, is it just this historical, political story, or is it something deeper than that? The problem is that the environmental story ignores the psychology of politics, what we know about the psychology of people who are conservative versus liberal. And we know a lot about it. And over time, I began to suspect, as I was watching more and more attacks on science coming from the right and how conservatives behave, that we needed to pull in that component of the story. Uh, so let me tell you how I started to realize that this was important. I became first aware of a body of research on a topic called biased or motivated reasoning. And one important researcher is actually an old friend of mine. His name is Brendan Nyhan. He's a political scientist at Dartmouth now, but I remember him back when he was a journalist like me in DC. And we were always concerned even then about why there are all these crazy wrong claims in politics and they pollute the discourse and they never seem to go away. All right? So he started to study this scientifically and what he did in one of his interesting experiments was he constructed fake newspaper articles and he had liberals and conservatives read them. Of course, he's testing their political beliefs before he gives them the actual article to read. And what he did in the article was that the article would contain a factual claim made by a politician, often George W. Bush, and it would be a factual claim, a real quote that, Ge that George W. Bush had said, something like saying that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, or saying that the tax cuts increased revenue to the government. Right? These are false claims. And in, in the latter case, it's probably you know, economically or even physically impossible. Uh, so he would, and then in some of the fake articles, 
The journalist would step in and say, this is not true, this is not correct. In other articles, the journalist would do no such thing, which is what journalists usually do, no such thing. Uh, so what happened, what happened in this research when conservatives are reading a claim by George W. Bush that they believe that's false, and then the, the journalist says it's false? What happens to their belief in the claim? All right. Has anybody seen the movie Swingers? You guys too young for that? <laughs> Have you, anybody played blackjack? What do you do if you get a 10 or 11 in blackjack? Double down. Double down. That's what the conservatives did. Uh, they doubled down on their false belief. They believed it stronger than before after it was refuted. All right. So what is up with that? Clearly, you need some kind of psychological explanation for something like that occurring. And not only was there this research on what's called motivated reasoning, uh, we also see in a lot of research, and I was becoming aware of this, this tendency for conservatives who know more about an issue, or, who, or at least think they know more about an issue, to be more factually wrong about it than if they know less. All right? And I call this in the book the smart idiot effect. All right? It's very, very important for understanding how the political right works. And I first became aware of this strange smart idiot effect in 2008 based on this Pew data, just basic polling data on Republicans, independents, and Democrats' belief in global warming, except they broke it down by college grads and not college grads. Uh, so what this means is that if you've got Republican, independent, Democrat, college grads, Republican, independent, Democrat, not college grads, uh, what you're seeing then is that if you're a Republican, the higher your level of education, the more likely you are to reject scientific reality. Okay? Because global warming is real and caused by humans. Um, but if you're an independent or a Democrat, the higher your level of education, the more likely you are to accept scientific reality. So this is the smart idiot effect. More education for Republicans equals more denial of reality. So again, like what is up with this? And it doesn't just happen on scientific issues. Uh, this effect has been detected, the same smart idiot effect, um, with a non-scientific but clearly false claim, the claim that President Obama is a Muslim. And John Sides, a political scientist at George Washington, uh, studied how belief in this false claim had increased from March 2009 to August 2010. And again, he broke it down by education. All right, so you got Republicans on the left, the red lines, Democrats on the right, the blue lines, okay, clearly, the belief increases more uh, among the Republicans, but then you've got college grad, high school or less, and some college, and the slopes are much greater for the some college and college grads than for the high school or less. So again, it's knowing more as a Republican that makes you more likely to believe these wrong things. So like, what is going on with Republicans? What is up <laughs> with this? And is this sort of political environmental account where, oh, there's, you know, the conservative movement came to exist, it pulled the coalition together, you know, it needed the people who hated taxes, it needed the corporate people, it needed the religious right. Is that really getting at this kind of effect? Or do we need something more? And I now think that we do. What my first book didn't consider, and what political and journalistic classes today are terrified of facing, although they cannot avoid it anymore, because I said the science is not controversial, at least among the scientists, uh, is the growing body of evidence suggesting that people who are liberal and people who are conservative are just different people, all right? Different in ways that go far beyond and that are probably prior to their beliefs in politics, all right? The beliefs in politics seem to be subsequent to the basic core differences and the different beliefs in politics are what happen when people you know, who, who differ already are kind of pushed to figure out what they feel about the world and then some things just feel right naturally and some things just don't feel right naturally. All right? As I went to work on a new book to succeed the Republican War on Science about why conservative denial of reality is even worse now, okay? You know, we didn't have claims that Obama is a Muslim back in 2005. We didn't have claims that he's a Kenyan uh, back in 2005. You know, these, this kind of stuff, and on and on and on. I just couldn't ignore this body of research any longer. This research suggesting that our political beliefs and our factual beliefs 
are partly the result of a core per set of personality traits or psychological traits or even in some cases physiological traits upon which people differ and the differences are at least partly inherited. Okay? Now, I want to be clear at the outset that liberals and conservatives are different people on average is just a fact. It is a fact that is value neutral. What you make of it is in your own hands. My contention is just that you cannot ignore it because it's a fact about the world. I think it helps us see a lot of things that is wrong with liberals, aka us, um, as well as things that are wrong with conservatives, and also see strengths in conservatives. Um, and I'll explain all that. But right now, let's just deal with the fact itself. It turns out that like all important insights, this is not a new one. And as I researched this, I came across this uh, Gilbert and Sullivan comic opera called Isle Empty, which is from the late 1800s, actually. Uh, and in it, they're kind of joking, but they express this idea that, hey, our political views are really inherited. And they do it in this comic verse, which I'm going to read to you. Nature always does contrive that every boy and every gal that's born into this world alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Or at least that's how I have to make it rhyme. I don't know how they made it rhyme uh, back then. Uh, so then, what is this? We can tell liberals and conservatives apart as children, like in the sandbox? That's not how we normally think of politics. Um, but actually, there's research suggesting that that may well be so. So the observation is not new, but it's extremely controversial and not accepted because we like to think about politics from a sort of blank slate perspective to invoke Steven Pinker. We like to ignore all kinds of things about human nature, and this is one of them. And so we like to assume that, oh, you know, we came to our views by thinking about the issues. But we just, you know, we started out from different places, so we ended up in different places. You know, put me in a different situation with different influences on me, and I could have been a right winger. Right? Right. Yeah, no way. Um, so the new science really challenges that assumption because if, if your political ideology is really just your set of conscious thoughts about how the world you know, and how politics should be structured, if that's really what it is, uh, then why on earth, and if it's purely the result of thinking rationally about the issues, then why would you find differences between liberals and conservatives in all kinds of areas that have nothing to do with politics? Why would you find differences between them in how they organize their bedrooms? All right? But you do. Liberals are messier. All right? And I think you guys probably know this. You pro this is probably kind of obvious to you, right? Liberals keep messier living spaces than conservatives do. Everything I'm saying here is based on published peer-reviewed research. And if, if politics is just you know, about our rational differences about how we think society should be ordered and structured, then why would liberals and conservatives have different preferences for art? But they do. Liberals are more appreciative of abstract art. Conservatives more like representational art, portraits and landscape paintings. Right? Is that political ideology? Well, and if it isn't, why is it a reliable way of distinguishing between what we think of as left and right? Or why do the two groups have different senses of humor? Okay? But they clearly have very different senses of humor. All right? And there is actually a real psychology study showing, studying liberal conservative responses to Colbert. And what it finds is that good news is that both groups think he's funny. Bad news is they think he's funny for completely different reasons. And liberals think he's funny because he's using satire to make fun of conservatives. And conservatives think that deep down he is a conservative. Now, what, is that, what does that say about the nature of political ideology? Um, and, you know, and the differences, the differences between left and right, you know, they just go on and on and on and on. Uh, a scientist with whom I collaborated for part of the book, his name is Everett Young, he found in his PhD dissertation, Studying Liberals and Conservatives, that conservatives were more likely to think the fans of rival sports teams are just bad people. All right? They were more likely to want to keep germs out of their bodies. And they were more likely to elect a candidate to Congress, to Congress who keeps his or her lawn neatly edged. So is that ideology? It's a reliable way of determining who's on the left and who's the right. 
and, and the research just gets weirder because there's also fascinating psychology studies, again, peer-reviewed, published in the literature, suggesting that you can take a liberal and make them into a temporary conservative all right, through various kinds of psychological or physiological manipulation. All right? You don't do this by convincing them of the rightness of conservative ideas, but you know how you can do it? One way you can do it is through alcohol intoxication. <laughs> right? um, so the, the scientists actually did this. They set, up, they, said, they set up outside of a bar, and they had a political questionnaire, and they had a breathalyzer. This is good research, right? <laughs> And uh, so they gave people the political questionnaire and included statements like property rights should be absolute. You know, do you agree or disagree with that? And what they found was that for both liberals and conservatives, in correlation with blood alcohol content, people shift to the right in their responses to the political questionnaire. All right, now, I mean, I'm sure with the hangover, the liberals probably get their own ideas back. But this is not the only way to do this, because a very similar study found of pretty much the same effect from asking people political questions in the proximity of a hand sanitizer. All right? So making people think about physical cleanliness, just like alcohol intoxication, shifts them to the right. And we presume that this is a temporary effect as well. Probably this is not a permanent effect. I mean, if you, you know, made their whole life surrounded by hand, hand sanitizer somehow. You know, so that everywhere they turned, they saw one. Maybe they would always be conservative. But it's probably a temporary thing. Uh, so it's suggesting there's something about ideology that you know, you're activating these kind of visceral impulses, or in the alcohol case, you're, you know, you're doing something cognitive, and it's leading to ideological outcomes. Uh, and this is, these are not the only things that reliably turn a liberal into a conservative. The most reliable of all, and we all know this, even if we may not admit it. The most reliable of all is causing them to feel mortal fear. All right? You want to push people to the right, you want to push a country to the right, just attack it. Just attack it and make people feel like they might die. And you will see people move to the right. All right? So again, this suggests that ideology is about something below the surface, not rational. It's not about the facts of the issues. So what the heck is it? Where does it live? Where is it housed? Well, as one scientist put it to me, it is not going to be in the elbow. All right? It is going to be in the brain. And yes, we have studies showing brain differences between liberals and conservatives, measurable brain differences. Big caveat, this is not what I based the book on. This is the new stuff. This is the controversial stuff. Uh, we don't know exactly what it means. And if this was the only research that we had, I wouldn't write a book about it because I think it's too new and too uncertain. But given that it is kind of the icing on the cake and all the psychological stuff has been going on for decades uh, and, it, and it is in line with that research, it doesn't refute it, it just confirms it in a new way, I think we should talk about it. So this is a study of University College of London students. All right, so we got British left, right, not American left, right, and there are differences, but there are also overlaps. And what they found uh, was that on average, and that's very important to say, on average, the conservatives had a somewhat larger right amygdala. And what is the amygdala? The amygdala is the brain's fear and threat center. We share it with other animals. We should be glad that we have it because it keeps us alive. All right? It is there to preserve us in situations of threat and situations of fear. When the amygdala is activated, you run. I mean, it does other things as well. Other, all parts of the brain do many things. Um, but, but this is one of its clear core functions. And in a situation where you're feeling that kind of fear, the amygdala takes over, it runs an automatic response program. It's called fight or flight. And it runs your body. Okay? It runs things. And it is evolved to do this. And it is evolved to keep you alive. All right? Everybody has one. It's just that on, in the conservatives, it was in this study slightly larger. All right? And then in the liberals, they found more gray matter in the anterior cingulate cortex. The anterior cingulate is a region that has been shown in a lot of studies to be, to be, seems to be playing a role in what's called error detection. In other words, you're going about some pattern of behavior, and suddenly you say, stop, wait, stop. I've got to do something different. I've got to change. I'm making a mistake. I shouldn't do this. All right? Liberals are somehow doing that more. All right? In this study, and these are not the only studies that associate left and right with these two brain regions. All right. 
I still think the brain stuff is young. I still think we need to be careful with it. But what is most scientifically certain and what is built on endless studies, including one that I ran for the book, is that liberals and conservatives just have different personalities. And to show that, I want to give you some screenshots from an experiment that we ran, I talk about it at the end of the book, um, where we're just asking college students their personalities, uh, questions to gauge their personalities, on a widely accepted, accepted scale called the Big Five personality traits. Uh, and I consider the questions completely apolitical in a traditional sense, but the pattern of responses always yield a left-right political gap. So he, these are some of the questions. We ask people, rate yourself on a one to seven scale from disagree strongly to agree strongly uh, with the following two terms to describe yourself. How much do you agree that you're artistic, a highly abstract thinker? Everybody in this room knows how to answer that question, and I'm going to bet that uh, you guys are more in the agreement end than the disagreement end. People differ, but more, you know, more agree than not agree. All right? How much do you agree that you see yourself as dependable and self-disciplined? And in this room, we're, we're going to be all over in this room, but you know, we're not going to be as strong on that. And um, how much do you agree that you're open to new experiences complex? And in this room, we're going to be agreeing with that. Okay? What have I just done here? Well, I've just done some basic questions to tap into the big five personality traits. And in particular, questions one and three trap into, tap into a trait called openness to experience which is highly associated with liberalism. And question two, order and structure in your life, basically, you know, how dependable and self-disciplined are you, taps into a trait called conscientiousness, which tends towards more conservatism. All right? uh, so this is how the big, tr big five personality traits look when you compare them with ideology. And this is a really powerful study of over 12,000 people, where they looked at their political views, they looked at their big five traits, and they looked at level of income and level of education, and how well all of these things predict ideology. Blue means that these things predict you being on the left. Red means these things predict you being on the right. So let's go through it. Conscientiousness. That's order and structure in your life. You know, wanting to keep things on time. Driving to work the same way every day. All right? That tends to make you conservative. Openness. Tr wanting to try out new things. All right? Seeing issues as complex. Really powerful effect in making you liberal. All right? Agreeableness, that's empathy and politeness and things. Liberals and conservatives actually split a little bit uh, on that. There's three bars because we're talking about economic ideology and social ideology and overall ideology. Um, stability is the opposite of neuroticism. So liberals tend toward being more neurotic and conservatives tend toward being more stable. I told you this is not all good news for liberals. Right. Extroversion, conservatives tend toward slightly more extroversion. They probably have more friends. Okay, they're probably more willing to just come up and talk to you about anything. What's amazing about this is that these personality effects are at least as big as, in some cases, or even bigger than things that we all admit influence ideology. So here's income. And income has this powerful effect on economic ideology, right? So you make lots of money, you're likely to be a fiscal conservative. Everybody knows that, all right? But look, openness is, al is almost as big, or even bigger than income. Education makes you a social liberal and makes you an overall liberal, but it makes you slightly more uh, fiscally conservative, uh, which is interesting. But of course, you're probably making more money with education, so there's some relationship there. But look, openness is doing more to make you liberal than education. All right. So what makes you liberal? Openness and education. What makes you conservative? Money and structure. Why do conservatives deny reality? So I would argue that it's already up here on the board. And it's located right here. It's the lack of openness. The lack of openness to new information, new experience, new ideas, new people, and all the rest. So liberals tend to have it. Conservatives tend to not have it. So let's unpack this idea of openness. These are some slogans that appeal to the open personality. And this is why all you guys pay too much money for Mac computers. All right? And you know you do it. You know you do it. It's a marketing campaign aimed at liberals, and it works because it appeals to who you are. You want to be different. You want to stand out from the crowd, right? And they know that. Openness is about intellectual flexibility, tolerance of uncertainty, ambiguity, and change. 
In some cases it means really needing these things, wanting these things, wanting new sensations, wanting novelty, wanting difference. I want to go to new places. I want to jump out of an airplane. All right? These are, I would postulate a lot of times, strong characteristics of scientists as well. And of course the scientific community, as we'll see, is overwhelmingly liberal on average. Now, what this success suggests critically is that across eras and time periods and countries and political systems, there is always going to be this exploratory side of human nature, which we call openness, that leads to liberal tendencies in politics. So the open people are the ones that are more friendly to experiments and change and trying out new ideas and they're not as freaked out about people who are different, different from them. Uh, and then conservatism will always be with us and it's the opposite. It's not exploratory, it's aversive, it's defensive, it's friendly to st stability, it likes structure, it likes certainty, it doesn't like change. So no matter how much political systems evolve, no matter how much culture evolves or differs across time and space, there's a psychological core to the difference between the left and the right, and that of course explains why it occurs again and again and again. There's always a left and there's always a right. 